The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of ONTV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. That's Malik Kill. I'm Joey Tysick. And uh, we're at the end of August already. And um, getting into September, we are literally finally into football season. I'm saying officially because we're in week zero for college football. Even though I don't care about college football week zero. Malik, do you care about college football week zero? It is going to bring me life. It is going to make me happy. I might shed a tear. That's how that's how much this means to me. <clears throat> and uh, we've officially lost him. <laughs> We're too. Listen, I'm just it. Um, it's it's not that serious. I'm that's not. Too it's much. not really that dramatic. That's too but much. I'm I'm gonna be watching just because I love all college football, big programs, small programs. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna pay attention to UMass throughout the season or New Mexico State in Week Seven. But just for this one week, I'm going to be interested in what they're what these teams look like. Okay. Well. Yeah. We'll get to a couple week zero topics in a minute. Um, the one like outside the box note that we wanted to talk about: James Harden got fined a hundred thousand dollars for calling Daryl Morey a liar. At the end of the day, it's only a hundred thousand dollars. If this was like, you know, some mid level player, maybe I'd care a little bit. Was this James Harden we're talking about? He's got shoe deals. He's got endorsements. He's got lots of money. $100,000 is nothing. Um, I think someone could, you could say he doesn't need to play in the NBA anymore. Would you agree with that, Oh, yeah. He could easily retire. There's been, like, rumors that he wants to go play in China now. Let's let's just keep this argument. So Let's let's get this going. (laughs) So Get James Harden out of the NBA. How about that, people? I mean. Let's do it. uh, The... And then the NBA Players Association is kind of doing their, uh, I don't know. I don't want to call it knight in shining armor, but I guess like they're just trying to do their job where they're trying to dispute the $100,000 fine, uh, saying that it wasn't needed. I'm kind of on the fence about it. Um, I don't know. Like, I feel like Harden needed some sort of punishment because you can't just like go out and call like start calling people liars necessarily. I don't know. But at the same time, like you kind of can say what he wants and it's Daryl Morey's idea to respond to it. I don't know. It's a, it's a weird kind of dumb situation. Very uh, dumb. So, so I don't want to like linger on it, but it's just weird. It's just weird. This with no rules or regulations to the power player empowerment era things like this are going to happen more out more often mm-hmm. i think like there are there are multiple players in the nba that i could imagine being disgruntled soon or demanding a trade soon or quote unquote making things uncomfortable yeah for an organization mm-hmm. like even though he got an extension and he's making tons of money i i wouldn't be surprised in two or three years maybe two years it's like Carl Anthony Towns in Minnesota just start just started getting angry with the organization and started beefing with uh Anthony Edwards because I think him him and Anthony Edwards are on two different wavelengths. Anthony Edwards is a dog. Yeah. Carl Anthony Towns is is extremely talented, but he's he's not cut from the same cloth as Anthony Edwards. Carl Anthony Towns changed the game. The, hey. You see those three those three pointers he hit? Nobody incredible. Was, nobody was doing it before him. Listen, Dirk Nowitzki, who was that? Bill Lambeer, who's that? <laughs> and the, these reasons. Sam why, Bowie, who's that? Oh, why someone like Carl Anthony Towns will most likely get very sad and upset and emotional in the next few years. Mm-hmm. Because it, it usually happens in Minnesota. Yeah. But, like I said, him and Anthony Edwards, Anthony Edwards is the face of that franchise mm-hmm. and should be seen as such. <clears throat> and not just him, it'll be other guys. Yeah. 
I mean, they, players can voice their opinion whenever they want, and <clears throat> there are not there aren't many repercussions. So, yeah, yeah, it'd be very different if David Stern was still the commissioner. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. I fully agree. Um, other thing I wanted to mention: Have you watched Hard Knocks at all? Yes, I watched the first two episodes. Okay, that's exactly where I'm at. I haven't watched the third one because it comes out at like 10 p.m. Right? It, we're, yeah. And I don't weird. care as much about the Jets as I did last year for the Lions. I don't so. care about Hard Knocks like I used to. Yeah. I used to really get excited. To watch Even towards the end of the Lions season last year, I started to kind of tail off of it. wasn't as excited. Um, I think just because at towards the end, like your art, like the following week is. NFL season so like you don't care as much anymore about training camp because you're ready to see them actually on the field playing a real game yeah. I, I also I don't know if people realize every NFL team has a YouTube channel and every NFL team's YouTube channel has preseason videos yes that are basically the length of hard knocks yeah and like they do you, a lot you can of literally go to any, every NFL yeah. YouTube channel and they have 40 minute long videos mm-hmm. of players being mic'd up and like co- yeah. yeah, and some even turn them into a documentary style uh, feature. So, yeah, it, it's hard this day and age. I think Hard Knocks still does a good job. Um, to me, this isn't as appealing because it's just like focusing on Aaron Rodgers taking the the reins. Whereas, like, it was cool last year for the Lions because they they kind of surrounded it as a a young Lions team, and they talked about all these players that were trying to make the team and you saw uh, guys like bugs. And I remember the big one was Khalil Pimpleton who didn't end up making it and stuff. So like there was all these fringe guys that you kind of like got involved with hoping they could make it or uh, understanding their life and, and their background and stuff. And we haven't really seen that in the jets so far. I know it's only two episodes, but at the same time they focus so much on Aaron Rodgers in the first two episodes I'm curious where they'll go after that whole thing has fallen off. I mean, you're you're not wrong. I mean, there every season of Hard Knocks, there would be like a third string guy undrafted that they would follow. Mm-hmm. There would be two or three rookies. There would be a uh, like one of the superstars. They would like personally follow like four or five different types of players. Yeah, yeah. The the first two episodes has been like. 70 to 80 percent Aaron Rodgers yeah and then a few players after that which is for the most part which is weird because the Jets have like have some guys that are interesting yeah Israel Ab- Abanaconda he's really, from New York right <laughs> and they were they really haven't even talked about him. And he's had a good season but he's gonna get overshadowed because when they bring in Dalvin Cook I know that's obviously gonna be a whole episode uh so yeah I, I don't know it, it's interesting I like it I like I always like to seeing the coaches like the different coaching styles and the uh and the comparing to them like Nathaniel Hackett is kind of fun and joking and Robert Sala is always like what's next what's next and that's like their whole mantra um so that kind of stuff is is interesting to me but yeah I, I'm kind of with you like it it kind of tails off a little bit I did like seeing uh the narrator though Lee Schreiber yeah, yeah that was cool that was pretty cool um, and Aaron Rodgers kept <laughs> describing him as God or the voice of God. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, so I, I hate to say it, uh, that I don't, I don't mind Aaron Rodgers in this. And that's weird Listen, for this, me to say. This is a, like a very controversial opinion today. I've never hated Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Like I, he's never personally made me angry. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've, I've appreciated how good of a quarterback he is. Yeah. And just watching them throw the ball is pretty, pretty fun. Mm-hmm. But like all the stuff off the field, I he yeah. says weird stuff. I'm like, okay, darkness retreats. Right. Do my own research. I, I okay. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it for me too. Is like Aaron Rodgers to me. I think he's very much like, like Russell Westbrook, in the reasons that I don't necessarily like him. Like I think sometimes he gets overvalued. I think. Russ Russ is just he's very aggressive yeah. all the time. And I he he doesn't necessarily have like super strong stances. Mm-hmm. He's just always like kind yeah. of yeah. Aaron Rodgers he's is kind Russ. of a a mix of Russ and maybe Ky- Kyrie or something. He's the mix of yeah. <laughs> Kyrie to an even like deeper extent. Yeah, for sure. Um but like 
I I especially hate this year, and it's not necessarily Aaron Rodgers either. Like I yeah, I also don't like his off field stuff. It's kind of weird. But it seems like he's a good teammate. It seems like people like him. They're gonna show his best highlights in the in hard knocks. But his throwing looks amazing. So if he can do that like this during the season, it'll be kind of like Tom Brady for me, where I, I'm not, I've never been a big Tom Brady fan, but like watching Tom Brady in his last couple of years, like you couldn't deny some of the throws he made were incredible. So if Aaron Rodgers can do that, I'll get it. Um, but I don't know. It's 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 a confusing time for me because I, I just hate how much hype the Jets are getting right now. Um, I know that their defense is really good. People think that Aaron Rodgers is going to be back to MVP form, but I mean, last year he didn't look so good. So to me, it's, it's a little bit overhyped, I guess, but that's going to happen either way. Um, where do I want to go to next? Oh, let's just talk about week zero. Cause then we can finish off with preseason stuff and we can just kind of talk whatever about the preseason that we want. Um, Week zero of college football, like we said, a lot of duds, not, <laughs> not, not too many exciting things, um, but you do have some top teams in Notre Dame and USC playing. Um, Notre Dame is going to take on Navy. USC is going to take on San Jose State. Yeah. And uh, and unless you have like a fire stick, where you can watch like all games, mm-hmm. they're playing on the Pac-12, so most yeah. people pro- probably won't even see the game. Mm-hmm. Navy Notre Dame is on NBC, and Notre Dame is favored by twenty and a half. Yeah, the only like real interesting game outside of those two, Ohio and San Diego State are both going to be good teams. Mm-hmm. So even like if you watch MAC football, some people are big fans of like the MACTION football yeah. during the week. Ohio is going to be one of the better teams in the MAC, mm-hmm. and San Diego State, who is coached by Brady Hoke, is they've made a bowl like. They're, they've been a consistent bowl team for like more than over a decade. Yeah. So they, they play good physical football. So that should be a fun game. And uh, third string quarterback for the Jaguars, Nathan Rourke, the guy that made that circus play against the Cowboys mm-hmm. where he fell down and threw the touchdown pass. His brother, Curtis Rourke, is arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the country. He's put up like fantastic numbers, and he's probably going to be another like NFL caliber guy so he'll be fun to watch Hmm. how interested are you the most the even lot the like according to betting the best game is utep versus jacksonville state how interested are you i disagree strongly (laughs) that's the even line the only interesting part about that game utep has a fun offense jacksonville state is coached by rich rodriguez that's fun yeah that that's about as fun as it gets. I I think Utah's gonna win by double digits, double digits most likely. Mm-hmm. Uh, UMass, no New Mexico State. There's there's no reason to really pay attention to that. It's there's no real reason. You can pass that one. Okay. Um, I want to talk about Navy Notre Dame for just a minute because Navy has a new coach. Does that matter though? It doesn't. They're gonna <laughs> lose. But I'm I'm just saying, Kenny and Matalolo coached like, Navy for like the past twenty years. And now Navy has a new coach. They, it's pretty weird. They're the most. They're they're just the most predictable team of all time. Are you saying that because they run the option? <laughs> yes. Is that every team that runs the option? <laughs> Probably, but I feel like Navy is kind of that notable team, you know. Um, especially with the Army Navy game, like Navy threw through ninety one passes last year. Yeah, that actually, I and that's only attempts. I can't remember the exact rule or why it was implemented, but for some reason there was an implementation where you they, those teams can't run the option like they used to anymore. Hmm. So now Navy and Army have to like pass a little bit more. So it won't it won't be as slow and methodical as it used to be. Like they have to play with a little bit of pace. Yeah. So we'll see how that looks. It's just <laughs> it's it's a weird thing. Listen, I I I love that the option is still a thing. I I enjoy it. You, I mean, I like watching the option. Like you, I guess, you, but... you, they'll never be able to recruit like high level players yeah. to run sh- like these, <laughs> like these newer generation offenses. Mm-hmm. So if if you don't run that option, what do you do? Yeah, but just find somebody that can like pass out of the option. <laughs> There's still passing plays out I of the option. That, yeah, 
But they go with that's, but that's also hard. How, how do you get a good quarterback to come to a service academy school? I don't know. He's <laughs> got a bit. I mean, hey, David Robinson, man. Keenan Reynolds was a Heisman candidate, and he barely threw the ball. He was just elite at running the ball. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Notre Dame's gonna wipe the floor with him, unfortunately. I uh, think last year Notre Dame won, but the, it wasn't like a complete embarrassment. Mm-hmm. Like the those option teams still figure out how to make it hard. Like uh, Army almost beat Oklahoma a few years ago. Kyler Murray's team, yeah. Michigan barely beat Army. That was one of the most frustrating games I've ever seen. But those option teams can frustrate big, bigger level teams. Yeah. Um, what should we watch out for with Notre Dame this season? Sam Hartman is their quarterback. Came from Wake Forest. He is the all-time passing leader in ACC history. A lot of yards, a lot of touchdowns, a lot of picks also because he's a gunslinger. Mm-hmm. But they're bringing him, bringing him in hoping that he is the first quarterback, honestly, in a in a long time, that can like be stable and also like have high-level flashes. They've brought in so many recruits that have been disappointments in the past decade mm-hmm. that like Ian Book, is one of the better quarterbacks they've had in the past 20 years. Yeah. And that's not a good reflection of quarterback history at a high level program. Right. So they're looking for Sam Hartman and Sam Hartman to like be the stability at quarterback. They're bringing back Audric Estime at running back. He's like 5'11, 230. He's huge. They're still trying to figure out receiver. Mm-hmm. But they lose Michael Mayer. Yeah. Who one of the best basically... tight ends in the country, drafted by the Raiders. Yep. They're. Figuring out they're they're basically figuring out all of like pass catching options, receiver, tight end. They gotta find out who their main guys are. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they're gonna be figuring things out the first few weeks. Okay. Let's uh bounce over to USC San Jose State, just so we can get into we wanted to talk about the the Pac twelve a little bit today. USC is bringing back the number one guy, Caleb Williams. And there's talk that he may not declare for the draft. Where is that coming from? I saw it today. Why would he do that? Um, that depending on who has the number one pick, that he might get picky. Okay. Well, well, you, you as the number one pick, you you have leverage. Even though Eli Manning had mm-hmm. the Mannings behind him, like right. you you can say I'm not going here, mm-hmm. and you can hold out. Like he can still go into the yeah. draft. You can tank workouts if you really wanted to. <laughs> The quarterbacks have done you this before. Ways. John Elway told the Colts, I'm not going to the Colts. Mm-hmm. And he ended up a, a Bronco. Like, these yeah. things happen. Yeah. And, like, he could just, I don't know. But, yeah, there's so many ways. Yeah. He, I wouldn't judge him either because he wouldn't be the first to do it. Yeah. And, plus, waiting another year, it, that's not going to really change much either. Is going to the Big Ten really going to change things? It'll you're the be, top pick already. Yeah, but, like. If you're the top pick next year, you're most likely going to be – you're going to have that same little list of teams that might get it. Exactly. Uh, so it's kind of weird. Um, but USC, are they the – are they an outright favorite to win this uh, division or this um, conference? Some people think they are. I do not think they are. Okay. Uh, they have gotten more pieces in the transfer portal on defense. Mm-hmm. They re- they've recruited pretty decently. But those are like freshmen and sophomores. You can't fully rely on them. Yeah. I still don't think the USC defense is going to be very good. They they need to be at least average to win the Pac-12. And I need to see them prove that they can be at least average against better teams. Mm-hmm. Like, I think Washington has a chance. Michael Penix is back. They have one of the best receiving cores in the country. Several guys that will be in the NFL. Right. They're, they've got a veteran defense coming back. Oregon is bringing back Bo Nix. Mm-hmm. He's got receiving to, like, you can't say the Washington and Oregon don't have chances. Right. I haven't even, I haven't brought up Utah. Yeah. Who's won the Pac-12 the past 2 years. Mm-hmm. Like is is there are so many other options at the top, three specifically that I I just I can't just say just cuz USC has Caleb Williams that everything is going to be smooth for them. Like Yeah. They still have to go out and prove it. They almost lost to Oregon State last year, who was a quality team and might be even better this year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, there's no way I would say USC is like the obvious favorite, right? And Utah really only lost Dalton Kincaid, yeah. and uh, they lose any defensive guys this year. Uh, they lost a few guys. Uh, they lost their best corner. I forgot his name. He got drafted by the Falcons. They lost a few guys, but they've they've recruited so well. 
and they're always so well coached that yeah. their defense is always good, at right. least. Mm-hmm. They never have a bad defense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although Cam Rising, he's still dealing with his injury from last year. People don't know if he's going to be fully healthy for week one against Florida. Mm-hmm. So that's a bit of a question. But once once Pac-12 games get going, I assume he's going to be out there playing. Yeah. Um. So you have, would you say you have USC, Washington, then Utah? I, I personally, I would have Washington first. Okay. Washington. And then USC, and then I would have USC and Oregon tied at two. Okay. That Washington offense, if they're healthy, I think they there's no defense in the Pac-12 that can stop them. I think they're just as dangerous as USC's offense. Mm-hmm. And I, most people wouldn't think that just because USC has Caleb Williams. Washington's offense was a handful to deal with last year. Right. And they averaged like 30-something, almost 40 points a game. Mm-hmm. I, I would have Washington at one personally. And then USC and Oregon tied at two because I I don't think there's a lot of separation between okay. the two. Oregon is more talented on defense, but they still have to show that they can put it all together on the field. Yeah. And then I would probably have – I would have Utah at four, but I believe in Oregon State a lot. That pins on DJ Uyunglele a ton. Yeah. Who just got named the starter at Oregon State coming from Clemson. Right. Yeah, it, it's interesting because not a lot of these teams really lost anybody um, of significance that I can think of off the top yeah, of my head. Most of their – every top team brought back their quarterback and mm-hmm. most of their main options on offense. Yeah. So you got Caleb Williams, you got Michael Penix, uh, Bo Nix in there, yeah. DJ maybe. Cam, R- Cam Rising is like set at like the fourth best quarterback in that. Cam Rising would be like a top two quarterback in most conferences, but the Pac-12 is just so stacked in terms of top right. quarterbacks. Yeah. I guess the, the team that I didn't mention that would be the team that lost the most would be UCLA. <laughs> and what? I, I was just about to say we haven't even brought up UCLA. Right. Which was going to be my next thing of, like, is there another team that you could think that maybe sneaks into potentially being good, like a dark horse? Oh, yeah, that I think I, – I don't think they're a 10-win team necessarily because they, they have to replace quarterback. Dorian Thompson-Robinson is gone. They brought in Dante Moore from Detroit. Still breaks my heart. Uh, him and Ethan Garbers are battling for the number one job. It seems like Ethan Garbers – a guy that's been in the program for a few years is kind of like in the lead right now. Right. But I assume Dante Moore will play eventually. Dante Moore's the Martin Luther King quarterback? Yeah. Okay. Just five star. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In my opinion, he was the best quarterback in this class. Yeah. Of yeah, freshman yeah. guys. Mm-hmm. For sure. But yeah. UCLA, they brought in like some really good receivers in the transfer portal. A kid from Cal, J. Michael Sturdivant, and a kid from U- uh, USC, Kyle Ford. And my personally, after the Michigan running backs, one of my favorite running backs in the country, kid named Carson Steele, hmm. really good name, kid out of kid out of Indiana. He has long blonde hair. He runs super hard. He was at Ball State last year. He rushed for like sixteen hundred yards and like fifteen touchdowns. And he decided to transfer to UCLA. He might be their number one back hmm. with Zach Charbonnet leaving. So I like what they have on offense. Yeah, but they're another team, kind of like. USC, where they they have some really good pieces on offense, but the defense has been the hang-up with Chip Kelly. Yeah. First, first four or five years at UCLA. So I'm not sure what the defense will look like, but either Ethan Garbers or Dante Moore, I expect them to play well in Chip Kelly's system. And they have the pieces on offense to win eight or nine games. I, I think they can win nine games at most. Mm-hmm. Ten would be a major surprise. Like, they would pull off upsets to win ten games. I expect them to be at least an eight win team. Yeah. Um seven or eight. So I, I have to mention the Washington MSU game. Yeah. Is is there any hope for the Spartans? What what week is that? That's week three. Yeah. Listen, man. I can't wait to get to this Big Ten preview. They got Central and Richmond the first few weeks. Those games aren't gonna tell you anything about MSU. I know. I know. Uh, uh, and then they just get put into the gauntlet. Five o'clock at, on Peacock. Yeah. Jeez, what a strange world we're living in now. Right. Luckily, it's at MSU. 
it's at MSU, but I also so, that might not be good because they could shut down that home crowd home crowd very quickly. Yeah, like I I haven't heard anything out of out of the MSU camp about the DBs like major making huge improvements. Mm-hmm. Like they obviously have talent and they've recruited well in the past few classes. Right. But you have to see if those guys can make impacts. Mm-hmm. Like MSU's front seven, what they've done recruiting and through the transfer portal, I think they'll be pretty strong. Yeah. Like Jacoby Winman coming back, he he'll be a good pass rusher. Mm-hmm. And I forgot the name of the guy they brought from Texas A and M. He's like a hybrid defensive end, defensive tackle. He's mm-hmm. really powerful on the line. But hey, man, I got to see what Noah Kim or Kaden Hauser does on offense. Who's the running back? Who are the main two main two running backs going to be? Yeah. Who are the Who's your receiver? I, I mean, you you got I um. Don't want to talk about it. <laughs> You got the kid. Oh my God, the kid from Pontiac. He was like the number three. Trey Mosley. You got Trey Mosley. He's a he's dependable. Yeah. But you don't know if he's your number one. Malik Carr might be like your most dangerous. Yeah. On uh, paper, I, I've had a lot of right I've had a lot of hope for Malik Carr. He, he looked good uh, last year. So hopefully there there's some more growth there. Yeah. They they got a they also brought in like two other tight ends in the transfer portal. So I don't know if they're trying to work in like a two or three tight end system. I'm not sure. Yeah. But they gotta target him a lot. Mm-hmm. They they gotta draw up things to get him the ball. Yeah. But I I don't know how much of a chance they have I against mean, Washington in that game. I honestly also don't know what their running back room is gonna be, like how they're gonna do. Like they brought back Berger. Elijah Collins went to Oregon State. Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, yeah. you're right. I mean Jalen Berger showed signs last year. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> he showed the promise of when he was a high four star guy. Yeah, I mean, you got the the kid from Georgia. I can't remember his name. He's like a junior now. He got a uh, lot. Of, he he played a lot that, as a freshman. Is that Broussard? No, he he came in as a recruit a few years ago. Is his last name Simmons? Oh yeah, you're right. Um, okay, I'll have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, I want to look at the stats. Jordan Simmons. Yeah, Jordan Simmons is back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know what like what their hopes are for him. I just hate but, that they have a revolving yeah. door of running. Yeah, Jalen Berger. You got Jarek Broussard. You got Simmons. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah, you lo- losing Jaden Reed is just tough. Yes. He was the ultimate playmaker. No, player. losing Keon Coleman is tough. <laughs> that too. <Malik. laughs> that too. Come I'm on. sorry. I apologize. That was I the... listen. We're saving the deep dive for the yeah, Big I know. 10 preview. I know. I'm going too far. <laughs> I'm going too far. Just when I was like really liking Keon Coleman too, but yeah, I I, mm. I don't I don't I don't know how they stay within double digits of Washington. Mm. They're, they're, that offense is just too dangerous. Unless Noah Kim is him, yeah, they they'll have to get like consistent pressure on Michael Penix, yeah, to have a chance. And either Noah Kim or Caden Hauser has to be him, yeah, to keep pace. Right. Um. How is Washington's defense? Washington's defense. Like has been sell me on them winning the pack. They've been somewhat underwhelming mm-hmm. since Jimmy Lake left because he was all defense and like no offense, and that's what made them so terrible that that one year he was head coach. Yeah. So they brought in Kalen DeBoer and his <clears throat> in his first season they win ten games, and their defense was just good enough to keep them in in like most games, but. They have to take a next step if they want to win the conference. Okay. They they have to be able to take a next step. Like they on on paper they don't have any like standout superstar guy. They have a, a few guys that are like potential all conference, but they don't have like that all American guy mm-hmm. unless somebody emerges. But yeah. Okay. They should they should be slight at least slightly better. Okay. They should be an okay defense. So then, do you think it would be fairly easy for USC to take over? To take them over at number one, like in the conference, because you think Washington's going to win, right? That's what you said. I said I would have them at number one because there's, it's something about Lincoln Riley teams, and specifically this second chapter of this USC Lincoln Riley team. Mm-hmm. They don't have enough on defense. Okay. First of all, Lincoln Riley does not coach defense really. Yeah. Right. And secondly, they don't. He doesn't have the players. Like he brought in Bear Alexander from Georgia, a big five star defensive tackle that was a freshman last year. He already has a few like he has some knickknack injuries in camp that has kept him out. 
that you don't have any like star players on that defense. And because Lincoln Riley is the coach, I don't trust them to play very good defense for the most part. Mm-hmm. So they're they're talented enough to win most games because of their offense. Right. But they'll also keep teams in it. Like Arizona has the has the offense to most likely stay in a game with them. Like last year they did. Hmm. I think USC beat Arizona like forty nine to like forty two last year. Hopefully their defense is better than that now. Yeah. But I I don't know. So you just think that Caleb Williams has to be even better than he has been if they want to like he has to basically be on the he has to stay healthy and be just as good or even better. Okay. For them to win the con if they win the conference, they're going to the playoff. Right. Yeah. And I just don't I just can't see the I can't see them getting to the playoff. Okay. Because first of all, the Caleb Williams and nobody's won two Heisman since the seventies. Right. I don't see him winning back to back Heisman's. Mm-hmm. There are some people that think Michael Penix might have just as yeah. good a chance to win a Heisman. Yeah, I've heard that now. Yeah, that because he's healthy now. So yeah, he's fully healthy. Like I said, his receiving core is really good, and I don't think many people are going to stop him. Yeah, they're going to put up at least like forty several times. Okay, now I want you to make the case for Oregon. If Oregon's going to win the conference, what do they have to do? What do they have on to get paper? Right? Oregon is the most talented team in the Pac-12. <clears throat> They've done an amazing job from Mario Diaz, I mean, uh, Manny Diaz, to uh, I'm not Manny Diaz, Mario Cristobal was their coach. I was thinking of Miami's old coach. Mario Cristobal recruited very well for Oregon. It didn't lead to them t- making the run people expected. Uh, now they bring in, I forgot the coach's name. Oregon head coach. I'll never know it. Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning has continued recruiting at a very high level. Um, they just, it's just, uh, it's, I've said almost the same thing for every Pac-12 team. They have to show it. No Pac-12 team had a great defense last year. Mm-hmm. Utah had a good defense. Oregon State had a really good defense. But, like, none of the most talented teams have really good defenses. I don't know if it's a West Coast thing. I, I don't know if it's because of the style of play has changed so much. But Oregon has the at least recruits and high-level talent to do it. Mm-hmm. And one guy I'm paying attention to, DJ Uyunglele's little brother, I think his name is Mateo Uyunglele. Mm. He is a true freshman at Oregon. He was the top defensive end in the country. And uh, it's going to be really fun seeing Oregon play Oregon State. <laughs> hmm. Little brother versus big brother. But, yeah, he's he's expected to play a lot on the defensive line as a defensive end and give them a lot of pass rushing ability. Oregon has the most talent. Bo Nix is really good. I don't want I might swing myself to say their number. I'm just gonna stick with Washington okay. as my number one right now. And say Oregon I was just trying to yeah. get get a a case made for the, how that team would overcome. Like or Oregon has what it takes to win the Pac-12. Yeah, but I I don't know what it is. I just I just see Michael Penix in that Washington offense just consistently outplaying everybody else. Okay. Um, is there any any other Pac-12 team you want to mention? I like Arizona. They went from one win to five wins last year. They have a ton of talent on offense. The recruiting has gone up another level. Ted Aroa McMillan is a guy to watch. He's a He was a five-star guy last year. Picked Arizona over Oregon. He was their highest rate of recruiting school history when he, when he committed. And he was instantly an uh, impact guy. <clears throat> He's going to be an NFL guy. He's a big play, 6'4", like almost 200 pounds. He can run. He can go up and get it. He's an overall just problem at receiver. So he's one to watch. Uh, Yeah, I, I I hope they can win six games and get to a bowl. Mm-hmm. They have enough firepower to do it. But looking at their schedule, yeah, Mississippi State week two won't be easy. They got Washington, USC, Washington State, and Oregon in four straight weeks. <laughs> Yeah, their their schedule isn't easy. They yeah. can go six and six. 
you know, I'm I'm just gonna predict it. They're gonna go six and six. They're gonna be like the the team right in the middle of the Pac-12. Cause I I think they they have enough to do it. After winning five last year, they can win six. Okay. Yeah. Are you sad to see the Pac-12 disappear? Because that's basically what's going to happen. <laughs> I personally... This is the salute <laughs> to the Pac-12. I personally haven't loved like what that conference has been recently. I've still watched... like Pac-12 after dark has been entertaining in the past few years. Mm-hmm. But... See, their teams like can never get over the hump. Yeah. Washington made the playoff and got smacked by Alabama one year. Mm-hmm. Oregon... Making the playoff in like the very first year was the one time they had a chance, and they just they couldn't beat Ohio State. Right. Yeah, they they've just always been a league that's been known for finesse mm-hmm. and not being physical enough to make real runs. Like, there's a reason why Utah has always come out on <laughs> in the end the past few years. Right. Because the other teams just they don't have what it takes to outlast like a real physical team, and Utah just always figures it out in the end. Yeah. That could be different this year this being the last year in the conference, but you can't count out Utah because they've done it two years in a row. It's going to be weird mm-hmm. seeing the West Coast Conference go on. Yeah. It, it is going to be very strange. Like the Rose Bowl, I don't know what the Rose Bowl becomes now. Mm-hmm. Like it was like the Pac-12 slash Pac-10 champion versus the Big Ten champion. That's what the Rose Bowl was for over 40 years. Right. So changing that, it's it's just it's strange. Yeah. For me, I don't have too many like fond memories of the Pac-12 necessarily. Um, back when I like remember watching, like Stanford had some good teams, of course, with Andrew Luck. Um, Oregon was always my team, though. I'll be honest. The, the teams with like Dennis Dixon or was, Marcus Mariota. I was about to say you were a Joey Harrington guy. No, that was before <laughs> I go got. In, that was before I got into football. <laughs> Joey Harrington was way before yeah. I got into football. Dennis Dixon was when, like, Chip Kelly started putting yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Michael James, DeAnthony Thomas. Yeah. They were just a fun team to watch. And I always said that if I ever played college sports and I had a ton of D1 offers to any school that I wanted to go to, I would pick Oregon every day. Um, So that's, like, the only team that I can really even think about that I have somewhat sadness to see go. Never really liked USC. Never really liked UCLA. Um, UCLA, the last couple of years were fun with DTR and uh, Charbonnet going over there, but I don't know. USC, I always hated too because their quarterbacks for a long time never worked out in the NFL and stuff. And I don't know. It just bothered me. <laughs> One of those weird things, you know? Uh, kind of like the, uh, the Ohio State quarterback deal for a while. Um, so to me, it doesn't hurt that much. I'm sure for the college fans it's probably pretty tough but um yeah i will say i feel bad for oregon state because they're they're starting to like reemerge as a football program yeah and now they're just being left right in the middle of nowhere yeah and that that really sucks like i i'm a fan of what oregon state is becoming yeah and a lot of people have proposed uh i think you included talking about them moving to the mountain west which is W- they which, would be they would become like the top dog I in the know. conference. That's what I'm saying but, though. Yeah. That would just be awful for them to be in a basically non competitive conference, in my opinion. Uh at least for where they're at right now. Um but yeah. At least in in basketball the Mountain West wouldn't be too bad. Um, but yeah, it it's weird. It it's gonna yeah. be weird and it's gonna keep happening. Like we, we like we talked about more conferences are going to probably start dissolving. It's it's going to be weird. Before we move on. Okay. We haven't brought up Colorado in prime time. Okay. That's they're, they're I thought about that. They're the team everybody's watching to see if they're Listen, they won one game last year. Yeah. Whatever criticism you want to put on Dion in this first year, I think it's not warranted in one bit unless it's like just it completely falls apart. Mhm. Which Listen, this is like a portal team. Yeah. He basically he like brought in a 70 to 80% brand new team. Right. This is unprecedented for college football. Mhm. He brought in his son Shador from Jackson State who I believe in. 
I believe in his talent. I think he will eventually be an NFL quarterback. I think he will put up good numbers. I think he has recruited well for this first team. I think he's brought in a bunch of good transfers. And Travis Hunter could literally be a starting corner or a receiver at any school in the country. That is how much of a phenom talent Travis Hunter is. Will they make a bowl game? I don't think so. <laughs> I think at best, at best, they win five. If they win six games, Dion might be Pac-12 Coach of the Year. Yeah. Because that this, what he's doing, this is like the next like version of a rebuild. Right. Just completely flipping it. He's flipping a team mm-hmm. from one year to the next and trying to make it work in one, like in this first year. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. If, if they win four games, that's a successful season to me. Last year, they were probably like, they were bottom three worst teams in the FBS. Yeah. They were they were by far the worst Power Five team in college football last year. Right, it was disgusting. Mm-hmm. So if they win four or five games, it is a five games is a huge success. They make a bowl game, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. That, I just hope they. I hope they win four. If they if they go three and nine, it, I wouldn't be surprised, and it wouldn't be scary mm-hmm. to me because it's so much of a flip and a rebuild. Right. Yeah. Pete, come on. The people like. People's opinions are going to be all over the place. We know it's probably going to be absurd. Yeah. But it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. They won't be that great. Yeah. And with that, the Pac-12 is over. R.I.P. Goodbye. (laughs) Um, All right, move on to a a little bit of preseason football talk for the NFL. A couple of the little news highlights. Uh, I didn't see it yet, but. You had said that Sam Darnold has gotten the number two spot on San Francisco's quarterback depth chart over Trey Lance. They got some decisions to make. Oh boy, I think he's he's got to be traded at this point. Like, there's no way yeah. they're gonna hold on to him with a young Brock Purdy. Sam Darnold is technically still young, so like if they already like those two more, like they can have them around for longer. Um, and I don't know if they, they like their their Super Bowl window is short that they can't be worrying about developing Trey Lance, I think. I think they needed him to maybe develop for a year and figure it out in year two. Yeah. Doesn't look like it's happened. It's kind of unfortunate. I think he can still be a good quarterback, but uh, probably not going to be with San Francisco, I would say. Um, and then another trade that might happen, I'm kind of skeptical of it, but uh, Jonathan Taylor finally did get uh, the opportunity where the Colts said, you can go and seek out a trade. Doesn't sound like anybody's going to be biting um, necessarily. Uh, you never I know. I think somebody will bite eventually. I thought somebody would have bit on Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler was in the same situation. I know he's a little bit older, um, but I, I don't know. And if somebody's interested, though, it's are the Colts interested in their offer? That's the next step. That's the problem. Um and it sounds like nobody wants to give up a first round pick. Um, so I don't know how that's going to work, but it'll be unfortunate if Jonathan Taylor gets traded because I think him and Anthony Richardson would be really exciting. Um, but Jonathan Taylor would also be exciting probably in another location that is a better team overall. Um, preseason week two for the lions played against the Jaguars. Oh boy, it was not fun to watch. I watched it for like the first quarter and it was ugly. It was not great. They didn't play like any starters. So there was nothing to really go off of. Um, I think Nate, Nate Sudfeld probably, probably ended his career uh, <laughs> with that game. <laughs> He's a veteran backup. So I. Know. I, I Somebody I don't will really put him, feel bad for him. Somebody will put him on the roster. <laughs> Practice squad QB Nate Sudfeld. Oh, uh, man. He went 9 for 18, threw a touchdown, threw a terrible interception Teddy, again. Teddy obviously wasn't comfortable at all yet. No. Yeah. Uh, good old two gloves. He he also two struggled a little bit. Two gloves and number 50. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> a bit much. It's a lot. Uh, Bridgewater yeah. went for 5 for 11 for 34 yards. Not getting much done. The running game was awful. <laughs> Um, but again, Jameer gives in play. None of the wide receivers played. They let all the young guys go. 
Dylan I, Drummond. I think there are maybe like two or three good things from this game. <laughs> yeah. One of them, I th- sign Chase Coda. I am I am on the Chase Coda. He had a good punt return. Hmm. He had a touchdown catch. He had another catch that looked like it was going to be very impressive. Yeah. That Teddy threw to the sideline and he reached out to grab. Like that kid can play. I think that was kind of the the biggest problem that I had was this game was supposed to like give us knowledge of what wide receiver they were going to keep between like Drummond, Antoine Green, Chase Cota, like who was going to maybe make like the depth chart and not be practice squad. And uh, they didn't have a quarterback thrown to them yeah. throughout the entire that's game. Right. That's what in, in those very few moments, Chase Cota really stood out. Yeah. And Jack Campbell, to, to me, he's, he's, he's for real. I'm going to say this every single week. Mm-hmm. I love the Jack Campbell pick then, and I'm going to keep loving it. Yeah. Like he is the guy. Yeah. Yeah, the defense didn't look too bad uh, for the most part. Um, James Houston got a sack. John Kaminsky got a sack. They both look pretty good. This, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that might be a little out there and hot takeish. Okay. There are moments where Judd, where James Houston looks like an absolute like <sighs> he looks like like a perennial Pro Bowl pass rusher at times. Mm-hmm. Does this dude have like in a secret unlocked potential? Because it's like on a daily, not a daily, but from a game to game basis, mm-hmm. there's at least one play where he just either like bends around an offensive lineman or just runs through somebody. Yeah. And it's like, who is this dude? I mean, he had eight sacks in seven games last year. That's what I like. Is is this dude's potential? What do you think this guy's ceiling is? Because he, he shows something every game where it's like, well, how is he doing this? Yeah. We have to keep him around, obviously. Um, he looks like a serious weapon. How much of a weapon do you think he could really be? <sighs> to me, it looks like he could maybe be a pro bowler if he stays healthy. Because he has such natural talent mm-hmm. rushing the passer. Yeah. I, I mean, I hate to get too overhyped. Pro Bowl might be a little bit too crazy, but like just a. Even if he just makes one. Just like a solid <laughs> pass rusher guy. Pass rusher. He could easily be a 10 sack guy. I, I'm like, I'm not taking that away from him. Um, if we could get twelve sacks out of him in a season, that that's what I, I to me he looks like a guy that could potentially be like yeah one or two seasons. It's like James Houston has twelve or thirteen sacks in back to back seasons. Yeah, and everybody's like, where did this dude come from? Mm-hmm. That's how good he looks to me sometimes. Yeah, I, I think that's how this. I think that's how this defensive line could turn <laughs> out. To be honest, it it's not, it sounded like you had a little anger and hope at the same time. Yeah, when you said that, it makes it obviously as a Lions fan, it always makes you nervous when you start to get hyped about things. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to overblow it. But if if Aiden and James Houston can just stay on the same development track that they're on right now, they could be a force. Listen, you got them two on the D line. Mm-hmm. You got Jack Campbell and Rodrigo head hunting. Mm-hmm. And Jack, Brian, Brian and, Branch apparently is and forcing his way on the roster. They're saying they cannot. Well, he's th- he's forcing himself into like potentially. Yeah, yeah. Like they're saying they would feel dumb if they didn't start him. So they're mo- they're starting to move C.J. Gardner Johnson around, and Brian Branch looks like he's going to start with Tracy Walker. Listen, they they have young guys mm-hmm. at every level of the defense that I know can be impactful. I know. And I'm not even drinking the blue Kool Aid. I know, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just, yeah, I'm just looking at it how it is. People think that Aleem McNeil is gonna be a good pick, and um, we've seen little things out of like Josh Pascal finally, little little signs maybe. Is the dude they picked out of Western Kentucky? Is he hurt? Um, I haven't heard like a peep about him. I'm trying to think who is that. <laughs> Let's find his name. Um. Oh, it's it's jarring Lions my mind. Draft picks. I can I can not. I didn't remember either. I can just pull up the roster, maybe. Um, his name is. Who can find it first? Broderick Martin. Dang. It. <laughs> I was literally yeah. right there. Dude. I've heard nothing about Broderick Martin. Yeah, now that you say it, I don't know too much either. He's had two tackles. See, I didn't even know he was playing so far. But I I do agree. I think he's been kind of banged up a little bit. 
as far as I know. But, yeah, I mean, it's just looking at the going down the line, like, apparently there's been some, like, Julian Okwara, like, trade rumor stuff. I would, st- I still think he's got something in there. Um, Romeo Okwara, like, there's good, there's a good mix of young guys and some, some veteran type guys. Um, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I hate to say that this team could be really good, but like, Look at our safeties. C.J. Gardner-Johnson, Kirby Joseph, Tracy Walker, Brian Branch. That's insane. And last year, our secondary was trash. Yeah. That's maybe the only thing that's exciting. I don't know what they're going to get out of preseason week three. The Lions aren't really a team where they play their starters in the preseason. They are going to go up the pan- against the Panthers, too. And if the Panther- Panthers play their starters... On defense, the Lions offense is once again going to have a rough time. Because without the Lions offensive starters, that Panthers defense is actually pretty good. Um, So I'll be curious to see what happens there. Um, Any other standouts in preseason week two that you can uh, think of? Um, Any other standouts? I think Tanner McKee looked really good for the Eagles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like... His, I, I was getting frustrated watching them play because his receivers were dropping balls and, like, they just weren't making plays. And yeah. he was dropping high-level, like, in-the-bucket passes mm-hmm. on back-shoulder throws and deep balls. Like, right. he, he can really throw it. People don't realize. he's He decided to stay at Stanford, mm-hmm. and they were terrible. <laughs> and Stanford had, like, a high-level quarterback, and they just couldn't get anything done. Yeah. So I was really impressed with Tanner McKee. The Giants' offense looked really good in their like few drives. Yeah, yeah. They looked like Darren Waller was easily getting passes. Daniel Jones looks good. Jalen Hyatt got a touchdown pass from your boy, mm. Tyrod. <laughs> from Tyrod. Yep. They look good. Um, the Steelers' offense looked like they could take a step. Yeah, Kenny Pickett's starting to look pretty solid. Like yeah. I was going to mention, like my whole thing was going to be young quarterbacks looked good. We both really enjoyed Sam Howell on Monday night. Oh, yeah. He he looked really good. He and Jahan Dotson look like they have some good chemistry going. Yeah. Um, and that's unfortunate for Terry McLaurin. Um, he did get some turf toe, so he might be banged up heading into week one. But they said it shouldn't shouldn't matter. But, like, the commanders, they could be sneaky good. They could be interesting. Yeah. They won. Did they win nine games last year? Um. I maybe it was eight. Maybe like they were eight, eight and one. Yeah, I don't think they quite made but it to nine. They won eight games last year, and at times they were like, "It, they, they got stuff. Yeah. They got talent on both sides of the ball." Exactly. Yeah, they have a stable offense. They could really surprise people. They got a lot of good guys at skill positions, um, things like that. Yeah, the overall standout rookie quarterback in preseason has been Aiden O'Connell. Yeah, and that's been really surprising. Mm-hmm. Like he's. He's been efficient. He's been accurate. Right. He's thrown like three touchdowns to no picks. Yeah. He's been really impressive. Which, honestly, it could be nice for the Raiders. Like, if if Jimmy Garoppolo gets hurt or struggles even, the Raiders might just decide to to reset and just go with Aiden O'Connell. I I wouldn't be completely surprised if that happens. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other one I was going to mention, too, is just more of um, confidence from Malik Willis, I think, again. He still looks – he looked really good, of course, running the ball um, against the Vikings. His throwing is getting better. It's still a little shaky at times, but it looks like he's just going to outright beat Will Levis um, on the depth chart, which is another scary thing. And then uh, also for Tennessee, Ty J. Spears looks really good. Yeah. So, like, if, if Derrick Henry – goes down at all or anything like that, that could be that could be good for them. Yeah. My boy Deuce had another impressive run. Only average like two point eight a carry, but we're not gonna talk about that. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. He's still figuring out the game, but in the in the open field he is obviously super hard to contain. Yeah. He's just so elusive and at his size people have a hard time like getting a target on him. Right. So he's he's gonna make a lot of people miss. Mm-hmm. Oh, the other one we have to talk about that I almost forgot. 
your real boy, Ronnie Bell. Listen. I know he's playing against backups and stuff, and he's not playing against the starters. Listen. <laughs> I have said, <laughs> and I, I I had a tweet a few years ago. It might have been at the start of last season. Mm-hmm. Or it's two seasons ago. I can't remember. I tweeted, and I don't, I, I, I don't think anybody responded. <laughs> I tweeted that Ronnie Bell was just as good as Chris Olave. Mm. And that if he was at Ohio State, he would put up the exact same numbers. Ronnie Bell is going to be a good NFL receiver for a long time. Yeah. And if you're a receiver at the University of Michigan, I am kind of depressed at, at this moment to say having a career like Ronnie Bell's is like as good as it gets at, at Michigan right now. <laughs> and I don't know if it's just Harbaugh's fault or the mm. way the offense has been constructed. Michigan's offense has not been built to let a receiver have a high level season for years now. Yeah. They had Nico Collins. They had Donovan Peoples Jones. If either of those guys were at Ohio State, they would be first round picks. Yeah. And Donovan Peoples Jones was like a seventh round pick. Mm -hmm. Nico was like a third round pick because he blew up the combine. We might be able to see Nico this year, though. Yeah. He he might be the Texans Texans number one. But listen. Ronnie Bell is a very good receiver. Mm-hmm. Just as good as a lot of guys that put up better numbers in college. And he's showing his skill. Yeah. He he show he's he's has great hands. He's a great route runner. He's not the fastest, but he's quick. He's a very good number two. Yeah. And he could easily find himself into that number three slot um for the 49ers. Yeah. I think. Obviously, Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk number one. But, like, we've seen Jawan Jennings um, before, and it seems like the 49ers always have kind of a, a random third receiver that's out there. Oh, like, Ray Ray McLeod um, is another one. So, like, I think he could def- definitely jump in there and uh, be that number three guy. So, yeah. Um, last thing I wanted to mention really quick, too. Baker Mayfield is the starter for Tampa Bay. How long do you think that lasts? When did the Kyle Trask era begin? Because Kyle Trask looked pretty good in uh, the preseason. I'm about to. I'm looking at the Buccaneers' schedule. <laughs> Vikings week one. Their defense isn't anything crazy, right? Bears week two. Eagles week three. Saints week four. Lions. The, the that stretch of weeks four through six. Mm-hmm. Might things might get really scary for Baker. Yeah. Yeah, Eagles, Saints, and Lions defenses back to back to back. Right. There might be some picks and some fumbles, mm-hmm. and there will be some rumblings about Kyle Trask yeah. around week seven. Okay. Yeah. The Falcons defense isn't anything to. Yeah, they'll be. They should be all right too. And then the Bills defense. Yeah, around week seven <laughs> might be the time people are like, let's just put Trask in and see what he has. Yeah. Man, the Bucks schedule is kind of brutal. They also got to play the Forty yeah. ers Tough. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Unless this is just another year where Baker Mayfield all of a sudden. He just figures it out. Yeah. I mean, he's got Mike Evans, which it seems like a perfect He's pairing. got him. He's got Chris Godwin. Yeah. He's got pieces around him. Right. Just uh, depends if he can use them or not. All right. That does it for today. We have college yeah. football this weekend, Malik. Yeah. And zero. I won't be watching at all. Um, yeah, next week we talk about the big weekend. Yeah. Week one. We'll do a full on Big Ten preview. We'll get to any other teams that we can. Um, and then then the following week, NFL season kicks off. And then we're just back into talking about games, which is perfect. So, this has uh, been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Rest in peace to the Pac 12. We might not miss you that much, but it's still sad that you're going.